Hey, everybody. My name is Jay Keck with the South Carolina Wildlife Federation. I'm the industry habitat manager, and uh, we are here with Charlie, and I'm not going to say your last name. You can do that. Um, and she's with uh, Clemson Extension, and she is, I don't know if you're a shoreline specialist, but you're my go-to person whenever I have shoreline questions, um, restoration questions specifically. And instead of me, you know, going on and on about you, why don't you introduce yourself um, so I don't botch anything up and then uh, just kind of tell us how you got into what you're doing now and uh, kind of what, what fires you up and gets you going. Yeah, well, hey, Jay, thanks for having me today. Um, as he mentioned, my name is Charlie Green Thaler. It, it is a mouthful, but um, yeah, I work for Clemson Extension. I'm one of their area water agents. So shoreline buffers is just one kind of subject that we touch on, but um, I really enjoy it. I get to work with a wide variety of audiences. So from youth to farmers to um, pond owners, all different types of people, um, helping them with any water issues they have. And yeah, I, I am from South Carolina uh, originally. I'm from the upstate. I moved to the Midlands about three years ago, and um, I went to Clemson. So I don't just work for them. I have been a tiger my whole life, but mm -hmm. I got my bachelor's and master's through Clemson. And um uh, my degree is in environmental and natural resources. So I, I've always loved being outside, um, grew up on a cattle farm. So I, I just appreciate our land and working with it and, and, you know, learning more of what we can do to better serve it. So that's kind of how I got involved. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we'll get going. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, today we're going to talk about shoreline buffers um here's a brief outline we're gonna i'm gonna give a little background so some terms that will get us on the same page then we'll go into the meat of the uh presentation talking about these shoreline buffers what they are their many benefits and then how you can install one on your property or um a neighboring property and then then i'm going to end with some helpful resources um, that will just help make that installation process even more easy. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I mentioned I do work for Clemson Extension, but that doesn't always mean anything or something to some people. So um, we are the outreach arm of the university. So we take all of that research that's being done on campus and across the state at our research centers, and we make it available to the public in a variety of ways. So I talked about all the audiences I work with um, and we reach the, them through workshops, newsletters, classes, or even webinars like this. Um, and we have eight main program teams. So not just water, but we have forestry, uh, agribusiness, youth, 4-H, so all kinds of different areas that we cover. Um, and again, I, I am on the water team. And this is a map I just wanted to show. This is all of our water teams, so the coverage that we have throughout the state. Um, we have two types of water agents. So I'm a regional agent. I work more with rural or agricultural audiences. And then we also have our Carolina Clear, our, our stormwater agents. And they're peppered throughout the state, working more with our urban audience. But, and you'll see that big purple um, area in the middle. That is all the many counties that I cover. So I do cover 10 counties and I am housed out of Lexington, but really the main takeaway is wherever you are in the state, we have an agent that can help you with any questions that you might have regarding this topic or our other um, topics that you have. And this is our web page. I just wanted to throw this in because and I'll end with some of our programs too, but this is a great place to go just to see what all we have going on throughout the state. Um, we have so many wonderful programs that are, you know, they cover a lot of different topics. And here is also where you can see what agent is in your county and who can help you. 
So, so, you know, that picture right there, it looked like y'all were on a boat and you were obviously with some young, young, young students, but um, I mean, do y'all, so y'all have programs um, like kind of ongoing throughout the year? Um, and, and if you do, uh, how, do, how do people find out about them? Just go onto the website in your region? Yes, that's a good question. Yes. So we have programs all throughout the year. This is from one of our summer camps. Um, we offer, it's called 4H2O and it's on the lake. And we actually did that in Lake Murray this past summer. So really fun. Um, but a good way to find that out is through the calendar that's on Clemson's page. And you can go to specific counties um, and it'll have the events. But um, we try to keep that on the web page. You can find the calendar of events. And do you have to good live question. in that region to you know, participate in, in those? Um, not necessarily. It just makes it easier if they are in person, obviously. But a lot of, you know, the one good thing that's come from COVID, we are doing a lot more stuff online. So yeah. it really doesn't matter, you know, what part of the state you're in, you can attend. So, um, yeah, very good question. Okay, so now once we know we know what Clemson Extension does, I wanted to um, throw out some key terms that we hear a lot, make sure we all understand what they mean, because sometimes we might not know the technical terms. So, so we're all on the same page. And that first word is watershed. I hear this all the time. Um, and again, it's not that hard of a concept, but it is an area of land where all the water drains to a common point. And what most people don't remember or think about is everything within that boundary is a part of the watershed. So the people, the animals, the cities, the towns, um, even the traditions and um, you know stories and people, those are all parts of the watershed. And so the main takeaway from what a watershed is, is what we do on our land is going to impact our waterways. And that could be either positively or negatively. It just depends how we, um, how, what we do within our watersheds. And so quick quiz question, just to get your mind going. Do you know what watershed that you live in or you're currently in? Jay, do you know? <laughs> um, let's see. I know the Broad River is relatively close and I know the Saluda River is really, really close. So I'm surrounded. And then we've got the Congaree down there. So you, you tell me with that information that I just gave you. Yeah, I kind of tricked you because here in the Midlands, a lot of them come together. So it, it depends. I am in the Saluda. Um, where I currently am, but you're right, the Broad, Catawba, all those kind of come together. So, um, but here in South Carolina, we do have eight major river basins or watersheds. And this is a great map. You can kind of pick out where you are and what watershed you're in. Um, again, what we do on our land really does impact our waters. And one common way that that happens is through what we call stormwater runoff. And that is our second term. Um, I hear this a lot as well. And many of our counties and municipals or municipalities, they have stormwater programs. And so you might see this around, but stormwater is just runoff generated by rainfall, melting ice, or too much irrigation. And as that runs across our landscape and those hard surfaces, it picks up a lot of different pollutants with it and can carry that to the nearest storm drain, like in this picture or ditch, or even just, you know, ultimately the nearest water body. And so there's many of different things that can pick up and we're gonna kind of quickly run through this list. Um, bacteria is a huge one. This is one we can't see, but, and obviously we know there are types of good and bad bacteria. This bacteria is not so good, and if found in high quantities in our water, it can actually cause human health problems. Um, and so this is one, this bacteria, it's a type of fecal coliform, or more specifically E. coli that we're interested in, is found in the intestinal tract of all warm-blooded animals. And so there's some different sources that we look at where this could come from one being pets and that's why you see people asking you to pick up after your pets one of the reasons um livestock especially when they have direct access to these creeks and streams 
uh, wildlife is one we don't normally think of, but when there's large nuisance uh, wildlife populations like feral hogs and things that can contribute um, more bacteria than what our landscape can handle. And then we're the fourth one, and that is through failing our leaking septic system. So it's hard to know where the source is coming from. And that's why I think bacteria is such a big issue because there could be, you know, there's many options. The next pollutant we look up, we look at is sediment. Um, this is obviously just from eroding soils. It could be from new construction sites, um, shorelines like we're going to talk today, anywhere where those soils are not stabilized. And, you know, dirt or sediment, we don't always think is a bad thing, but things actually like to stick to sediment too. So not only is it bad, but bacteria, other pollutants cling to that sediment. And so it's kind of a double whammy. But, um, you know, too much sediment in our streams, it can uh, affect the clarity, the turbidity, it can clog fish's gills, um, just a lot of different things can go on when we have too much of that in our systems. Motor oil, I, I really like this picture because I know we've all been in a parking lot after it's rain and we've seen that rainbow sheen on the pavement and that is exactly, you know, motor oil that has leaked there and something that we do not want within our systems, not good for wildlife, you know, oil and water, they don't mix. So <laughs> something we don't want. <laughs> Do you, do you know if, uh, uh, you know, that motor oil breaks down? I mean, I know it, uh, eventually it, it, it probably does, but. Um, I don't know the, the lifespan on it, but I know it does take a, a long time. Yeah. Okay. And, and just about the sediment, <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I drive from 26 and here in Chapin down to Columbia often. And I mean, the, the river there, uh, the, that would be the, the Saluda River, whenever mm -hmm. we go past the, the zoo, it looks like chocolate milk, you know, and, yeah. um, and that, I guess, historically, it, it wouldn't have looked like that, you know, 300 years ago, 400 years ago. Um, is, that, is that the case? Or, and is that, is that coloration and, and the sediment there because of all the runoff? That's a good question. It, it's really hard to know. And some of our streams are just more naturally um, turbid or more, you know, that color. You know, think of as we go down to the lower part of the state and we have our black rivers. I mean, that's natural. That's how they're supposed to look. This is definitely from, I would say it's amplified by sedimentation. I don't know how it would look without it. I still think there would be some type of just with the soils with it being clay soils to um, throughout some of that area. Um, I think it would have a brownish tint, but maybe not as much as it does because it does look like chocolate milk. That's a very good comparison. <laughs> and I see it after it's rained, it's worse. So that tells me that, you know, it is coming from something. Okay. So, very good question. Um, the next two fertilizers and pesticides, these aren't norm, you know, these aren't bad things, but when they're used um, outside of their designated use or the label is disregarded and we too much is put out, that's when we see issues. Um, these fertilizers have nutrients that our water does not necessarily need. And so when too much of those nutrients enter our waterways, that can lead to algal blooms. Um, I know here on Lake Murray and Lake Hartwell in the summer, you know, sometimes the the drinking water will actually have a really earthy taste. And that is from algal blooms within the lake. So too much nutrients. It's not necessarily harmful. It just is not aesthetically pleasing to our senses. So, um, you know, these have very real effects, not only on, you know, the look of the water, but also our drinking water. So those are big ones the next one's litter we see this everywhere this is just one you know obviously it's bad for the environment for the wildlife it's, it's just an easy one we can all do our part to not contribute to that litter load that we see and then the last one is fog or what we call fats oil and grease and that's just like cooking oils and fats make sure you're not dumping those down your sink drain um, and making sure that you're disposing of those properly. So as these all kind of 
add up and are picked up with that storm water, again, they're carried to the nearest water body. And all these little problems become really big problems. Um, another quiz question. So of that list, which one do you think is our biggest pollutant or problem here in South Carolina for our water? Mm. Do you want to guess? <laughs> no, I'll, I'll just take it for the team here. Okay. Uh, let's see. I am going to guess. I don't know. I see the, the soil in the water everywhere. So I'm just going to say soil. That's a, that's a very good guess. That's actually our second <laughs> biggest problem. So you're up there. Bacteria um, is the one that is so prevalent throughout our state. Currently, we have over 300 sites that are impaired for this pollutant. So that means that, you know, the levels are high in those areas. And those are just the ones that DHEC are testing. So I'm sure there's more out there. Um, but this is a big issue. And I think mainly because of all those sources I talked about, it's hard to know what is actually contributing to that bacteria problem. So very good. Um, one resource I kind of wanted to throw in is DHEX Watershed Atlas. And this is a really fun mapping. It's a GIS mapping interactive tool that you can uh, use online. This is a screenshot of Lake Murray. And why I like this um, resource is because you can pull up your area and you can actually see what impairments or pollutants are within that area. Um, you'll see this is actually pretty good. There were a couple bacteria um, impairments as well as swim advisories for mercury, but you know, this is just a good place to go to see your area and what issues um, are there. And this is updated daily, I guess, on their website? I'm not, I think so. I'm not sure how often they update it, but I know it is updated. I'm trying to think, frequently. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm not sure if it's daily, but uh, okay. they don't sample daily. I think they sample monthly. So I would think with that, okay. uh, but again, and it, you can, it's like a big rabbit hole. You can spend a lot of time on this. There's lots of layers and you can even go into watershed boundaries um even smaller than the ones I showed earlier so very interesting stuff so with all of this you know we know the problem we know that there is a problem so what can we do especially those of you who have property you know bordering the water or near a water body and that solution is really a combination of practices or what we call best management practices or BMPs um, these are all practices that mimic natural processes. So they're used to manage stormwater by slowing it down, kind of spreading it out over an area, and then promoting it to soak into that ground. Um, so the goal is really to deal with this runoff on site instead of making it become a bigger problem downstream. So you'll see a, lo a long list. Today, we're just obviously focusing on one of these tools, and that is shoreline buffers. So we're going to go ahead and dive into why y'all are really here, I know. <laughs> so what are these shoreline buffers? These are landscape shoreline that uses plants to protect and beautify the waterfront. And they're also referred to as shorescaping, so you might hear me throw that term out as well. Um, but just like a flower bed in your yard, a shorescape that uses a mixture of flowering plants can serve as a waterfront garden that improves the appearance of the shoreline and it can add value to your property. So buffers have the ability to change a pond from this. See, we see turf all the way up to the edge to this. I mean, that's all I have to show you. I mean, that's a huge difference. Um, not only are these aesthetically pleasing, but they provide so many benefits. And these are just a few. So buffers are a great way to incorporate native plants into your landscape. Um, we love native plants because what else loves those? Our native pollinators, right? And we wanna attract those as much as we can. Also, these buffers help to slow down that water and filter out those pollutants before they reach our waterway. So what we were just talking about. Um, and that picture I showed a minute ago with the turf all the way to the edge. 
So turf, I mean, that is vegetation. You, you can go back to that picture, Charlie, because, you yeah. know, what, what that reminds me of is is Lake Murray, where, where I grew up. And, you know, back I'm I was born in 78. So I was at the lake, you know, in the 80s and 90s. And, um, you know, it might not have looked like that picture on the right, the after, but there was button bush. There were some probably rose mallows, you know, with the huge flowers. Uh, there were trees, you know, that had fallen. Um, I mean, there were there were all sorts of things for critters to, uh, you know, to, to live in. And, um, you know, now most of the yards that border Lake Murray look like the one where the turf grass goes, you know, right into the shore. And um, just think of how devoid of life, you know, they're basically little deserts, you know, that lead from the yard to the lake um, where it used to be, you know, just just filled with life. I mean, I just remember finding egg sacs everywhere, oh, wow. uh, frogs, you know, um, the fish were everywhere. And I wasn't into birds back then. But think about all the the birds that used to be there uh, that aren't that don't have food. Now you were talking about native plants. And one of the reasons that we love them so much is, you know, the, the caterpillar pillars and all the insects that eat those uh, parts of the, the those particular plants, especially the leaves, and those just attract the birds. So, you know, if you're a bird fan like me, do do that right there, you know, what, what the, the after picture, and you will increase your, your not only just birds, but wildlife in general. So I, I love this picture. Yeah, I, I think it does such a good job, like you said, it's showing and, and people have gotten so accustomed to wanting that manicured look, you know, ease of maintenance and and where they can see any wildlife they might not want, like snakes. I know that is a big one we always get. People are, are really afraid. And so with this, you know, the before, they think they won't have as big of a problem. But um, the turf, you know, those roots, even though obviously it is vegetation, they're very shallow and they don't do a great job at holding in that sediment. Um, there's a lot of incising underneath that can happen. Um, so the, after these plants that we're gonna talk about, their root systems just do such a better job at not only you know providing that habitat, food source, but also stabilizing our shorelines because we, we can't make more of land. We have to protect what we have. And so make sure that it's not eroding um, and we're not losing land. Well, and think about maintaining that uh, before, you know, picture right there, just the land there. I mean, think about the the lawnmower that's needed, probably, you know, a uh, weed whacker or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, those lose the plastic, you know, um, oh, that's, yeah. that's used to, and just think about everything that's going in there, the uh, um, combustion from the engine, you know, all the nasty stuff that that's making it into the water, not just petroleum, you know, products, but, you know, the actual parts of whatever equipment that you're, you're using, all, all that's making it into the water. It is. Yeah. And so you're right. This is actually less maintenance. The after um, you're not having to do all of that. And so it is kind of a mindset we have to kind of change. But um, again, the pictures, like you said, they speak for themselves and um, this is our goal. So this is just something to keep in mind as I keep going through um, everything. But there are many benefits, like I was saying, um, those roots, they really do help to stabilize those shorelines. Um, again, they provide habitat. They also, believe it or not, can help reduce some pesky wildlife. So um, if you struggle and maybe have Canada geese on your property, these buffers are a really good way um, to help deter them that you might not have thought in the in the past. So geese like a very manicured lawn. They like that look of that first picture. They like to see what predators are out there and they really like easy access to the water. So whether it be a pond, lake or whatever. Um, so these buffers leave them a little unsettled and it discourages them from settling on your property. So that is a really good thing. But if you already have geese, um, as a problem, getting those buffers established might be a little tricky. Um, we have had projects where we've planted these buffers and geese have destroyed them within a weekend. So they, they'll they eat them <laughs> if you plant new plants. Um, but it is a good thing if, if you don't have geese and, and you don't want them and 
um, just a way to deter them. And there are some other options and I have resources that I'll share um, with on that too, because you I know a lot to, of people how to, struggle. How to overcome the challenge of geese eating the, the installed plants? There is some netting and like fencing, but I'm not sure how, you know, successful okay. <laughs> long term that is because, you know, we obviously want these established. Um, that's a very good question. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and once they are established, though, you know, and they're and they're relatively mature, the plants, you know, that I'm talking about, um, the, the geese pretty much just kind of leave that area alone. They do. Here. Okay. Good. Yes. They do. They don't, they like to be able to see. So they, they do not like that more um, natural okay. look. So okay. yeah, just some little fun facts, but with these uh, buffers, really it's easy as one, two, three, and four. So we're going to go over four steps um, on how to install these. So prior to planting, there's a lot of things you kind of want to think about and brainstorm. Um, so get out your notepad and pen and think about, you know, what are your designated uses for your body of water? Is it a lake, a fishing pond, a stormwater pond, a river? Um, is access needed for fishing or other recreational uses? You also want to consider how your neighbors or the community uses the waterway. So we want to make sure we're not putting plants um, in areas that may restrict any recreational use or navigation. And if it is a stormwater pond, you want to make sure that no plants obstruct the function uh, they provide. So we want to make sure nothing's, um, you know, harming the way it's collecting or treating stormwater runoff. So just some things to think about before we get really to the fun part, which is plant selection. Um, and our next slides that go through this, you'll, you can tell this is definitely my favorite part. Um, but buffers, again, are a great way to include these native plants that are just much better suited for our environment, our climate, and our wildlife. So one of the most important things to consider when planting a buffer is what plants to plant and where to plant them. Waterfronts have four very distinct zones that characterize the transition from land to water. Um, and each zone has suitable plants um, for each. So we're gonna go into each of those right now. This is a really great graphic that shows those zones. We have upland, riparian, emergent, and littoral. Um, so first we're gonna start in our upland zone. This is a part of the bank slope where soils do not stay permanently moist. So this is our driest area that we're gonna be working with. Um, and so that, and that's because the water's usually running off instead of kind of soaking in to that area. Since these zones are normally dry, you will need plants that are drought tolerant um, for this area and often our perennials or grasses are best suited. And these are just a small snapshot of possible plants for each of these. Um, this is not an extensive list. So just some of my favorites, you'll see muley grass on the screen, just some really pretty just beautiful plants that kind of get you excited and and make your um, land, you know, more pleasing. <laughs> they do get us excited. And and on your on the slide before you, it, it had goldenrod in the upland zone or upland zone. Mm -hmm. And you know, gosh, if there's one plant to install, um, it's it's goldenrod. I, I think here in South Carolina, um, well, I know across the nation, I think over a hundred different caterpillars can can digest those chemicals on, of, of goldenrod, whether that's in the stem or in the leaves or the flowers. Um, so I'm assuming probably here in South Carolina, you know, there might be 50, 60, 70 different species that can that can utilize or use the uh, that as a food wow. source when they're caterpillars. So it's a fantastic plant. Um, that's not the one that, you know, people are uh, allergic to in the fall time. That's uh, something else, uh, ragweed that blooms at the same time. But uh, you know, people see the goldenrod because it's nice and showy and bright and yellow. But uh, that's a great one. All these native grasses are also, you know, um, host plants to, to caterpillars. So, 
any of these natives um, are going to bring the insects, the beneficial insects, and then that's going to bring everything else that, that eat them. So, oh, that's place. awesome. Yeah. So then, once our upland, we're we're traveling into our riparian zone. This is a part of the bank slope that lies above the water surface, but it's where the soil remains permanently wet or saturated. So, you want something that like that has wet feet. Of uh, plants that strive or thrive in this zone, obviously they need that moist soils, and, but also can withstand extended periods submerged underwater. Um, but really, these prefer to grow at or just above the water line. Um, so keep that in mind when you are planting. And again, these are just small snapshot of suitable plants. You'll see lizard's tail up on the screen. Um, some very showy flowers, cardinal flower, swamp sunflower, beautiful things. So, um, yes. Can you just say that zone one more time? Because I like how you say it. Riparian. <laughs> Riparian. I got to find somebody from Penn State, you know, extension uh, to see how they say that. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> oh, me. Yeah, so next is our emergent. So this is the part of the slope that lies below the waterline, um, but it is shallow enough to allow emergent aquatic plants to root and grow upward above the water surface. So we still can see those plants and how pretty they are. And this zone is usually less than 12 inches deep. So the water's less than that 12 inches. Again, wonderful options, pickerel weed on the screen. That's my favorite. I've seen that grow in the upstate to the coast. So just a wonderful one that our, our pollinators love. Um, and that's what so, we're looking at right now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And with this zone, something to keep in mind, you do want to avoid plants that have a creeping lateral growth habit since they are rooted underground. You know, we want something that stands up a little bit taller. So vertical plants are much easier to manage within this zone since it is underwater. And then the last one is the littoral zone. This is the area below the water line that is too deep for plants, for emergent plants. So they're, they are under the water but it's still shallow enough that sunlight can penetrate through the water to the bottom. Uh, this zone will vary in its depth, so it could be anywhere. Usually it's from one to four feet deep, but you know, depending how clear your water is, it could be much deeper or much shallower if, if we've got that chocolate, you know, chocolate milk water. So, <laughs> um, but these, a lot of plants that are found in this area are actually normally invasive and need to be managed. So there aren't as many on our list. Here you'll see that we have eel grass um, and then some other ones, coontail and tape grass. This area, again, you know, normally we don't have as much vegetation, but still some things for our fish and um, macroinvertebrates that like to feed on within this area. Can you can you go back to the the slide before um, yes. and talk about the emergent zone one more time? Um, you know, yes. on, on Lake Murray with the fluctuation of the water, um, could you plant something um, like pickerel weed? Uh, you know, where it would be, you know, uh, I guess semi submerged, but then you know during the winter months, um, it's there's no water there. Uh, is is that would that still work there? Yes, and that's a good question, and I, I'll touch more into that a couple okay. slides, but okay, yes, sorry. you definitely can wherever the water is normally, you know, that normal level plant there, when they do drop the lake or anything, you might have to do some supplemental watering, especially if it's very dry, but they should be able to withstand those periods where the water is, you know, more shallow, or more shallow. Okay. So, Good question, because that is something our, you know, that we do have to deal with. Okay. Yeah. So no worries if you if you didn't get all those names of plants written down. Um, this was, you know, not that wasn't the purpose of that. I do want to show you where you can find a much more extensive list. One of those places is Clemson's Carolina Yards Plant Database, and this is good for all homeowners. This is one of my favorite resources that Clemson has. 
Um, you can use this for, you know, your yard, anywhere you want to plant plants, but it's great because you can tailor it for your specific conditions. You can put in your region. Do you want native plants? Um, fill all of that out. And at the bottom, you'll see an area for stormwater. So you can actually select shoreline buffer. So once you've, you know, put in all of your conditions, it will generate a list of suitable plants. And that includes pictures, all the different characteristics. It's just a really, really well done resource that will help you narrow down um, the plants that you kind of want to use uh, because there are lots. And in, in these zones, one thing to keep in mind is, um, you know, usually we, we like to pick about two or three that we plant within each zone. You don't want like 10 different, you know, one of 10 different types. It's better to do several of about two or three. So if you can narrow that down, I know that's a hard thing to do because there are so many wonderful ones, but this resource really does help with that. And one of the benefits of doing that is you don't you don't have just a few flowers blooming at once. You have a lot of flowers blooming at once. So if you only pick two or three, you know, those two or three, depending on, you know, the size of, of your property, um, they're going to bloom, um, you know, at, at one time um, or at least one of the three or one of the two is going to bloom. And then the next, you know, one is going to bloom. But there's going to be a lot of that one, which is helpful to, to pollinators. Um, if you planted 10 different ones and you just have one kind of blooming here, another one kind of blooming there, and you've got a bunch of variety, but there really aren't that many blooms at one time. Um, that's that's not really a benefit to pollinators. Oh, that's a that's a wonderful point. Yeah, another great place to find that list of plants. Um, this is Clemson's Home and Garden Information Center. And fun fact, this is actually Clemson's most viewed webpage. And yes, even above athletics, like this gets so many hits because of all the great information um, within it, fact sheets on all topics. But the one specifically for today is this Shorescaping Freshwater Shorelines fact sheet. It has a list by each zone that we talked about and so many plants for each. So another good place, um, if, if, like I said, if you didn't get everything written down or you want more inspiration, check out this website. And for those that are, you know, wondering where in the world to buy these from, you know, on our website, on South Carolina Wildlife Federation's website, um, we do have a, a pretty good list of um, nurseries around the state and just call them, just call them and see if they can, they can get the things that you're finding on, you know, this, this website that Charlie's talking about. Um, it's as easy as that. Some can uh, order them for you and, and some can't. Um, but I would just, you know, don't don't give up after one or two calls. Um, you'll you'll be able to find a lot of these plants that uh, that that we've talked about today and, and that are on this website here. Good to know. I didn't know you all had that. So I'll be using that, too. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So after you've picked out your plants, you found where you can buy them. Um, and you've actually planted them, there are a few things to keep in mind, um, kind of like what we were talking about. There are times that you might need to water these plants, um, especially right after you've planted them. Once uh, if they're in that um, riparian or upland zone, you might need to do some additional watering until they get um, established. And once they are established, you might only need to irrigate during times of drought, or if they, again, if they drop that, that level, um, you might need to irrigate some. So other than that, you know, these plants, again, they're native, so they're adapted to our climate, our environment. They can withstand those periods of drought better than other types of plants. So um, just something to keep in mind. Other things, uh, sometimes these plants do become dislodged, especially if you have a lot of wave action up against the shoreline. So one way to help prevent this is by using landscape pins or stable staples or stakes. Um, we've done this at our workshops and it really does help. Um, other things, if, if you do have severely eroded shorelines, you may want to consider using erosion control blankets or some type of, um, you know, fibers, coconut fibers, any type of erosion matting that might help stabilize those shores more 
um, because th that's obviously the goal of these plants is to help that, but until they grow and get those roots established, you might need a little extra help if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So with anything that we purchase or install, maintenance is key. You know, we want to ensure that these are going to keep working and functioning and providing those many benefits for as long as they can. If we were just to plant and, you know, not look at it for six months, there might be a lot going wrong. So uh, one way to keep up on what's going is routine inspections. Um, it's good just to go out there, look, see what's happening. This way you can catch any small problems before they do get out of control. Um, this could be, you know, wildlife damage, erosion hot spots, diseased or dying plants, just a few things that could go wrong. But, you know, take note of what's growing really well or what might not have done so well. That way you can make adjustments um, as you go. Yeah. And, and and don't give up, you know, right. things, some plants die. Um, yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it might not have been suited uh, to, to, your, to that property. And so, you know, uh, experiment. Um, if you nail it the first time, congratulations. Um, but but don't give up, you know, our, our waterways and our wildlife uh, need you um, to kind of persist and, and not give up. Yeah, I like that viewing it as an experiment because it is um, every where in the state's going to be different. So find what works for you and your yard. Um, some other things to consider, avoid using fertilizers or pesticides. Just we are so close to that to that water. Um, you're kind of asking to have that travel that short, that little ways into the water. So and again, these are native plants. They don't need as much of those nutrients and pesticides that other plants might need. Um, when it does come to weeding, hand pulling is the best way just to get rid of any weeds. You can use mulch um, in the upland zone, but if you use it any of those other, you know, riparian or emergent, they're just going to kind of travel into the water. So um, that's another way that can help suppress those weeds in that upland zone. Also, a good tip is to actually space the plants closely so that there's less room for weeds to kind of pop up within there um, and invade that buffer. So that's just another thing to think about. Um, if you do prune or mow or cut any plant material, make sure you're disposing of that properly. Don't just leave it there um, for it to get washed into the waterway. That adds again more nutrients into that water. Um, so just make sure you're disposing of it. And then make sure that plants are at least 10 to 15 feet away from any inlet pipes or outfalls. Um, we don't want them blocking the flow. As you can see in this picture, this is a good example of what not to do. All that pickerel weed had grown around that pipe. I mean, I, you wouldn't have even known it was there. So uh, make sure that you are aware of the different structures within if you do have a pond. Um, and that you're not planning too close. Hey, and just and just real quick, when you're talking about you know weeds, um, take take download iNaturalist um, onto your uh, smartphone because you know th those some of those you know, weed is a is a funny word. Um, people might call you know goldenrod a weed. Um, I would call it one of the best plants you know uh, in our in our country. Um, but uh, use iNaturalist, take a picture of it and see what it is. You might have something cool like rose mallow that just kind of popped up because you stopped using herbicides and, you know, fertilizers and, you know, you're, you're not mowing anymore. Um, and you, you might have some really nice natives that are, you know, uh, trying to get established there. And those are the ones that are going to last the longest, um, you know, the ones that are actually, you know, starting right there. So, you know, be careful what you're, what you're pulling, not to say, you know, don't pull the ones that you don't want, but um, if you don't know what it is, take a picture of it. Uh, iNaturalist is really good at identifying, you know, plants and animals. Um, so just, just, just something to consider. Yeah, that's a great point because I get that question a lot. What is this and how do I get rid of it? But they don't even really care what it is, you know, and it might be something really good. Um, but yes, identification of your plants is critical. So I, I love that. That's great. Okay, so 
again, I mentioned earlier that these shoreline buffers are just one tool within that toolbox when it comes to upland management for better protecting our water resources. So if you are interested in learning about those other things that were in that long list, things like rain gardens, bioswales, um, you know, floating wetlands, all these really cool things, you may be interested in our or in Clemson's Carolina Yards program. Um, this is really cool. It's a certification course, um, and it's all about sustainable landscapes and environmentally friendly yards. So if you, you know, you are on the lake or anywhere near the water, this is a really good one. Um, I encourage you to check out the website and you can learn more on how to certify your yard and find that awesome database that I showed earlier. And there's also an online course associated with that class. Um, and we have other online courses. These are just the ones that I thought might be most of interest, but master rain gardener, master pond manager, and then we have a new dam ownership course for pond owners. So really good um, options if you if you're wanting to learn more, we have we have those opportunities for you. We also have a lot of different programs. I know we mentioned that earlier where you can find those on the website, but here's just a um, brief description on some of those. We have um, a program called Be Well Informed, all about private homeowner wells, um, Be Septic Safes, about focusing on proper use and maintenance of our septic systems. We also work a lot with our farmers um, helping to measure the uniformity and efficiency of their large center pivot irrigation systems. And that's through our CPIT program. Um, again, we work with youth, with 4H2O, that's that camp that's on the lake. And then I also wanted to hit on stream bank repair. This is a newer program and it's perfect for those of you who live along a stream and need further information on ways to stabilize those shorelines. Cause that is a little different than our ponds and lakes. Um, but there is a manual that you could download for free on the website. So, and workshops all coming out throughout the state. So this is a one to be on the lookout for as we um, introduce it more. So and what's the process? Say if somebody has a stream or whatever kind of waterway, you know, that they, that they live by um, or on, uh do they call y'all and y'all come out and then you say hey this is a good landscaping company that might help you like could you kind of just help folks walk through that process yes um yes so a lot of the trainings for this are focused more on landscape and con contractors that could go out and do the work because there is some some grading some you know things that require a little of equ equipment um but if a homeowner were to call us you know, I would send them this manual. I would send them any of the workshops coming up. Um, it really, and if they can send us pictures of their yeah. site, if we can't get out there, okay. um, just so we know how severely, you know, eroded it is, um, just different things. Cause they might not need all of that grading. They might just need some plant um, selections or different things like that. This is really cool. Cause we use what's called live stakes. So it's cuttings of the tree in that dormant season. And you just plant that within the dirt and it grows within three months. It's amazing. So um, some different really fun things with, with this, so. Okay, yeah. awesome. Yeah. Okay, so really to wrap everything up, y'all stayed with me and hung on. <laughs> but I just wanted to highlight kind of all we've learned. We now know what watersheds are what maybe which one you're in um, we know those pollutant sources and ways to protect our water resources obviously one of those ways being through these shoreline buffers are through shorescaping um, and you know we want to make sure that if you do install these make sure you are uh, routinely inspecting them so there you can ensure that they're still functioning properly um, and last but not least, when it comes to buffers or any other questions you have, when in doubt, ask your local extension agent. Uh, we have an office in every county of our state, so we are always happy to help and answer anything you have. So with that, that's all I have. Um, hmm. But yeah, thank you, Jay.
Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, thank, thank you too um, for doing this for us. We'll pop this on our YouTube page <clears throat> so folks can watch it again or send it to friends. But um, you know, I, I can't remember what slide it was, but it might have been like five or six, you know, into it. But it was it ended with litter. You know, all the steps that to take to prevent, you know, or to make our waterways, you know, better for not only us but for wildlife and our planet. I mean, everything was preventable. Like you could. You know, if, if you did just those and just imagine, you know, if I don't know how many thousands of people live on the shores of Lake Murray and then all the rest of the lakes and rivers that we have in South Carolina. But could you imagine if everybody did it or at least half of the folks did this, like how much cleaner um, our waters and how much better off our, our, our wildlife would be and how much prettier our, our state would be, you know. Exactly. Um, so, you know, it, it works. Um, and I and I hope you all really consider doing the doing the work to um to make our water and our, and our wildlife, you know, have a, a will just be better, you know. Um, so thanks, thanks so much for sharing all this information, Charlie. Uh, you know, everybody thanks you. Um, you know, from SEWF and and the folks that are that are here. So um, we really appreciate it. And uh, anything you want to say um, before we head out? No, just thank y'all and yeah, do your part. Uh, education is key, and once we we know what the issues are, it's really easy to kind of do our part. So yeah, awesome. thank you. All right, Charlie, take it easy. <laughs>